So when we are talking of uh, the issue of uh, repre political representation, we are essentially talking about uh, in the context of parliamentary democracy that we have. Uh, therefore, what I will do is that uh, I will uh, discuss with you this particular issue uh, in which I will take some point for discussion. One is uh, we talk about what, what do we, we mean by political democracy, parliamentary form of political democracy and how decisions are taken uh, in parliamentary democracy and why it is called a parliamentary democracy. There I will talk about the, 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 the form of parliamentary democracy uh, in the country. Uh, that is UK where it emerged and then uh, the situation uh, in India with respect to parliamentary democracy and the problem that it creates or, or the issue that we uh, need to deal with uh, when we implement the parliamentary democracy in Indian context. Then the third issue I will take is that uh, recognizing the problem of uh, parliamentary democracy in Indian context, given that we have a diversified society. Uh, again, there is a problem or it is okay. Uh, how do we have dealt in the past and how we are dealing today? Uh, uh, the repre uh, representation of the various groups including religious minority, social minority, women and what method we have used uh, so far. And then I will uh, also discuss the issue of method of representation uh, that we have used and the problem associated with the method of representation and then the, uh, the current challenges that we face uh, as far as the parliament representation is concerned the emerging issue of representation of women, issue of representation of religious minorities and the and even the issue of uh, uh, representation of scheduled caste, scheduled tribe uh, in terms of whether it is a real representation or it is a nominal representation. So these are some of the issues that I will uh, share with you. Now when we talk of parliamentary democracy, there are two aspects of it. One is of course uh, it is a uh, form of government where the government is formed uh, by the representative of the people as against the monarchy where there is a king uh, which is the political power is through hereditary in one family. In political democracy the government which govern the country is uh, run by the representative of the people. So people are sovereign. They are sovereign and uh, uh, they are the ultimate power. It is the people who send their representative in the parliament and who govern the country as per the wishes, theoretically speaking, as per the wishes of the uh, people. So people are, uh, are really important and uh, the representative are supposed to represent the interest of the people. And therefore, the question of political party comes. There are different uh, uh, people uh, who represent, they would indicate that this particular ideology and this particular policy will bring the benefit to the people as against another group of people who will say that no, this ideology, this policies will be the well improvement in the well-being of the country. And therefore, it leads to the political party. In the parliamentary democracy, it leads to the concept of political parties and those polit political parties representing represent different ideological and policy uh, perspective. Uh, therefore, the political parties are very important uh, in the parliamentary democracy uh, who represent different ideological positions and different policies. And therefore, uh, the party system plays a very important role uh, in the 
parliamentary form of government or democracy. The other aspect of parliamentary democracy which you should remember is that uh, the, the concept of political majority that that parliament in parliament democracy you have the government of representative elected by the people and that the political party represent the ideology and view and the third aspect is the political party which get a majority seats, they constitute the government, they form the government and their ideology, their programs come into operation. So, the majority, political majority and majority decision making is also a very crucial aspect of the political democracy. These are three important aspects that you should remember because it has implications when we discuss the working of political democracy in Indian context. Now, uh, if you go back to the history of uh, uh, a parliamentary form of government in UK, one important point uh, that emerged uh, and we need to consider is the what kind of social structure they have. In UK where the parli par uh, par parliamentary democracy began, it began in the context where the society with respect to religion and social group is fairly homogeneous. You have Christianity as one religion, although you have two denominations, you have Protestant and you have Catholic, but nevertheless the values, the norms, the belief, the customs center around the Christianity. So there is a fair amount of homogeneity in which the democracy, parliamentary democracy operates. Now, when you come down to Indian situation and you, you take the same concept of parliamentary democracy, uh, government by the representative of the people, represented by political party and majority decision making rule operates, that parliamentary democracy in Indian context is operates in a social situation where there is a tremendous diversity and diversity of religion as against one religion in UK we have eight religion in India. All possible religion in the world are present in India. You name it and we have it. Then we have a diversity in terms of uh, ethnic background. We have tribal uh, uh, or Adivasi, uh, uh, denotified tribe, nomadic tribe. We have caste system, various caste group, high caste, low caste, middle caste. Uh, we have racial group, uh, uh, so it lead, it lead to racism, we have group which are of different color. So you can see that and of course we have the common diversity that we find in UK is also here that is male and female. Uh, but Indian society is characterized by the significant uh, diversity in terms of the social background of the people. And it is in this context that the, that the parliamentary democracy works. And therefore, it is not necessary that the result that the parliamentary democracy, the way the parliamentary democracy works in say UK and Europe. In Europe also most of the countries are Christian uh, uh, countries and they have their own language and some, uh, some culture. So the way the British uh, parliamentary democracy works in UK and Europe. Uh, it may not necessarily work in the similar way in Indian context which is characterized by immense amount of diversity. So that is the second point that I wish to convey to you and that we need to understand. Now this leads to another point that if we have a diverse group. And if a particular group, say religious group or a caste group is in majority in population, then it has its connection with the uh, uh, political party system in democracy. Political democracy and political majority is governed on the principle that uh, 
it is based on a particular ideology, economic and social, and it is based on policy. And that is how you contest the election, party contest the election, they come to power. Now, in Indian context, uh, a additional dimension is added to that uh, ideology and policy is that the social identity of the group may come into play in the party uh, elections. Therefore, uh, uh, we have to draw a distinction of political party or political majority which depends on which is governed by a particular ideology and policies, secular ideology and policies and in the election come to the power. But there can be a possibility that political party is also based on the religious identity, a majoritarian uh, religious identity may be Hindu, uh, may be Muslim in Pakistan, may be Muslim in Bangladesh or Buddhist in Sri Lanka, I am talking of South Asian country. So in the, in the, in the Indian context, the religion, the, uh, the religious group or caste group whose population is in majority may form religion and caste may form the base of political party as against the political ideology, secular political ideology and policies. Now this is the distinction that comes in, uh, in Indian context as far as the parliamentary democracy is concerned that the base of the political party instead of being secular ideology and policies, in addition to that the base of the political party could be religion, could be caste, could be ethnicity and a religious or a caste group which is in majority in terms of population uh, may uh, get a majority and occupy the power. And that is the, uh, uh, that is the typical feature of Indian parliamentary democracy that we have to understand. Now this is not a new thing that I am saying that the identity based political parties, uh, a phenomenon of identity based political party is not something which is new. It has been recognized by the British government and later on by the Indian government. So let me take the second issue then. How did we uh, uh, dealt with the uh, issue of uh, 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 the, the diversity in terms of population uh, in Indian context? In India, we have uh, uh, during British time and even today, what we have is that we have a, in terms of religion, Please come here. Uh, we have a religion, Hindu religion, which is in majority. Uh, more than two third of the population is Hindu. We have about fourteen percent population which is of Muslim. We have uh, one or two percent population of Sikhs, little less than that of Jain, little less than that of Buddhist. Then we have Parsis, but the majority religious group is Hindu. In terms of caste. Uh, uh, we have a small proportion of Brahmin, little, little more than that is higher caste and the OBCs are bulk which constitute close to half, and scheduled caste about 17 to 18 percent, tribal about 8 percent. In gender we have almost a, a half division, half and half uh, male and female. So this is the diversity, if we take the diversity of religion and caste. Uh, and how the Indian government or the British government dealt with this in, in, in terms of representation in the uh, political democracy. Now one of the consequences of the diversity is as I said already that uh, uh, it is likely that the majority religious group or majority caste group may form the base of political party and continuously be in the power the base of the political party remains some sort of economic policies and social policies and other policies, the education policy, but uh, the major base remain the caste or religion and as a result of which we a particular caste continue to control the power. Now if you look at the history of the, uh, the political parties in different state, the political scientists characterize one of the important feature of the political party in India is that in each of the state wherever they, whichever caste is in majority or 
single majority, 30 percent, 40 percent, they, co they, they come to power and they remain in power. And the most coalition happens. So, if you take Maharashtra, Marathas have been in power continuously for 70 years. You go to Andhra, Reddy, along with other, continue to control the power. So, whichever state you take, wherever the, the caste majority uh, uh, get into, uh, get the political base uh, to the party and they uh, hold the power. Policies may differ, depending on the policy, the group, caste group may divide, but the same caste will continue to hold the power we, uh, with certain variations. Now, when the religion got significance now, when we talk of religion as a base uh, for political party, then you see the uh, people began to talk about Hindu majority Indian rule. There is a, there is a book by Christopher Jaffer Leith and many others, the three, four author, that when people talk about rendering religion as a base to the political party, then the, the majority religion, uh, religion uh, support one particular political party and they tend to come to the, uh, the possibility of coming to the uh, power based on the religious identity. So, uh, you can see that the, the religion and the caste and ethnicity at time, North Eastern India, uh, uh, tribal characters uh, constitute the important social identity which influence the political power uh, and the representation. Now, this situation that I described to you was recognized by the British also, that Indian uh, society is character by, characterized by several groups uh, in terms of religion and caste and that there are minorities and there are majorities. And that minorities in terms of population may not be adequately represented in the parliament. Two things can happen, one is that the, the minority may not get representation in terms, at least in terms, in terms of their population share but also their interest may not be represented. So, so uh, there is a likelihood that when the majority caste and majority religion get hold of power, the minority in terms of population uh, may, not, may suffer from two problems. One is that they may not be adequately represented and secondly, for not having the uh, presence in the parliament, their interest may not be represented adequately. Other also talk about them, but uh, the their interests may not be adequately and sufficiently represented. These are the two problems. And I think the British government realized and therefore as back as 1909, the British government developed the policy of representation for minorities. It began with the reservation, political reservation and representation for Muslim in 1909. It also began representation to the European American, Anglo Indian and Christian uh, representation in the assemblies and the uh, in that type of the central assembly through nomination. So, we recognize that and try to give a representation to the Muslim and to the uh, European Christian, European uh, Christians and Anglo Indian uh, and the mechanism and institution that was used was not election. Uh, to some extent uh, it was considered in case of Muslim but basically through nomination. So, that is how we try to deal with the problem of representation of religious minorities and caste minority was not in, uh, in, in consideration, uh, but religious minority. So, we accepted the principle of representation of minority in terms of population uh, and develop a an, develop an mechanism whereby they get some representation. Now, this is not the case with UK for that matter. We dealt with our diversity in terms of population. Uh, uh, by giving them representation. This was in 1909 and in 1920 Ambedkar began to ask for representation of the scheduled caste. The scheduled caste being a, being a minority in terms of population, they should also get the representation the way Muslim gets, uh, the way Sikhs get it through nomination at that point of time. Sikhs get, European Christian get, Christian get, uh, Anglo Indian and Muslims. Uh, therefore, Ambedkar also began to argue for a, a rep political representation of the scheduled caste because he thought that uh, uh, they get excluded. 
Now, in any case, up to 1920 and up to 1935 Act, the right to vote was restricted to the certain economic uh, classes, certain caste, and certain uh, uh, groups. So, there was no adult suffrage, there was no adult uh, uh, right to vote for everybody to youth. But Ambedkar did ask for the uh, similar uh, representation through political reservation, either nomination or through election in the parliament and state assemblies. But here he asked uh, the uh, the representation through election and not through nomination, and therefore he do, he insists on um, uh, adult surface that is every adult should have a right to vote and through election there should be representation. He was against the nomination of minorities through through by the government. Now Ambedkar faced two theoretical problems at that point of time. He had to, because minority was defined in terms of religion and minority population, strictly speaking. The Muslims are 14 percent, and the Christians and others group are less than 1 percent. So, on their own, they won't be able to come. So, you require their representation. Whatever method is used, that's another story. Now, Ambedkar could justify, uh, could not justify in terms of religious minority, because Scheduled castes were not a religious minority, but they were a caste minority in terms of population. Therefore, Dr. Ambedkar redefined the concept of minority that we must understand. He redefined the concept of minority. He said that minority should not be uh, defined in terms of population alone, but the basic criteria for minority should be discrimination and exclusion from having an equal, equal right. He argued that there are minorities, religious minority, which are economically very strong. Um, their economic muscle power is very strong. Although they are minority in terms of population, but the scheduled caste not only is minority in population within the caste system, but it is suffered from a huge discrimination and isolation and deprivation. So he, he insists uh, economic discrimination, uh, discrimination as a criteria to identify a particular community as a minority and then entitled for the political representation. He argued with several uh, British commission, uh, uh, commission came to India and he was finally successful that his, his argument was accepted that in addition to the population, the criteria of discrimination should be used and by these two definitions, two criteria, scheduled caste uh, is a minority and they are then entitled for uh, political representation, political reservation. And then he asked reservation in public service, he asked reservation in education institution, he asked uh, financial support for educational development. Now that is how then in 1931 through Pune Pact, the re political representation of the scheduled caste came in addition to the political representation of religious minority and ethnic minority. Now this is uh, uh, the story that we have uh, as far as political representation is concerned or it is a you can call it a called it a group representation. Now what are the issues? Let me let me come down from 1932 to 1950. How did we incorporate the uh, issue of political representation in Indian constitution? The constitution assembly recognized political representation and reservation in politics for all religious minority including scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. That was the constitutional assembly decision. <coughs> Partition happens and Patel and others oppose political reservation through the separate electorate. The method I have not discussed with you the method I will come to the method later, but political representation to the separate electorate to schedule cause it was through joint electorate I will bring that concept later on. It is good enough for you to understand that the separate electorate and joint electorate method was used to give the political representation to the Muslim and uh, for Europeans and other was through nomination and for schedule cause uh, was through uh, joint electorate. When and it was therefore automatically approved by the constitutional assembly, but after the partition of Pakistan, uh, Pakistan Patel and some in Congress uh, were were little disturbed and shocked that separate electorate and they they thought that the separate electorate and separate reservation uh, representation of the Muslim was the reason as to why uh, 
partition was created, which was really not proper position as such. Why Pakistan was created, why Pakistan was necessary or not, there are several academic arguments, so if you are interested, you should read the book by Dr. Ambedkar, Thoughts on Pakistan, which we sold out within six months, so Ambedkar has to, uh, had to bring a second edition, Pakistan and Partition of India, uh, with a new title, and he also changed his position slightly. But he was the only one who dealt with the issue of uh, how the nations are formed. Uh, definition of nation, nations are forms and all that uh, very, very classical details in that particular book. But the important point for my discussion here is that after the partition, the Patel and Congress, uh, some of in the Congress decided that there should not be political reservation altogether. So after having approved in the Constitutional Assembly much larger body, uh, Patel brought back that issue to the minority advisory committee because it is the minority advisory committee had recommended that is a political reservation and approved by the constituent assembly but Patel brought it to the minority committee and say that no political reservation to anybody and uh, he then wanted to go back to the constituent assembly to scrap the political reservation. In the minority community Dr. Ambedkar raised a point of order. Dr. Ambedkar said that look if the res political reservation is approved by the constitutional assembly which is a higher body, how can the advisory body uh, then reopen it? But Patel did not listen to Dr. Ambedkar, he took it to constitutional assembly. And the general decision was that no reservation, political reservation to anybody. And then they tried to pursue Dr. Ambedkar that uh, as far as the Muslim and other religious minorities are concerned, we, we are going to sc scrap it. Please accept, please agree to the scrapping of political reservation even for even for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. Now this whole debate and beautiful discussion in Rajshekar Udu's book, you must read this book, Patel, Ambedkar and Gandhi. So he had got access to the original letters and the decision making. So what I am sharing with you is based on Rajshekar Udu's uh, book. Now when it was brought in the, uh, uh, before it was brought in the constituent assembly, the Effort were made, Munshi and other uh, effort were made to pursue Ambedkar not to insist for a political reservation for scheduled class and scheduled tribe. Ambedkar got political reservation in 1931 through Puna Pact. At that time, Ambedkar said no. I came in the Constitutional Assembly to protect the interests of the scheduled class. I fought it for 30 years. I, I cannot uh, accept this. And when there was a pressure, then he threatened to resign as the chairman of the drafting committee. That was, a, that was really a uh, that, that is what stopped Pandey, um, Patel and others to pursuing Dr. Ambedkar beyond the limit because if Ambedkar could have resigned as a chairman of the constitutional assembly, the whole process of constitution making could have been in trouble. So what they say, they, in constitutional assembly then, also assembly then what they pass, no reservation to religious minorities, but reservation to scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and to begin with for 10 years and it will be considered for extension for another 10 years. So for 70 years, the extension is given after every 10 years. That is how the political representation for scheduled caste came. Now, uh, the, uh, the problem of uh, minorities in political representation, that is how it was dealt in the constant assembly, but Dr. Ambedkar was realized Dr. Ambedkar was more concerned about the situation of religious and social minority in the parliamentary democracies which is which operates in a diversified society, diversified in terms of religion, caste and ethnicity and he felt that if the majority became communal, then there is a risk to the minorities, religious or social. And therefore, more than anybody else, Ambedkar was very much concerned about this issue and he tried to give a solution much before the uh, cons uh, constitution, uh, provision in the constitution. There are two important events which, uh, which are very important which you should remember is that Dr. Ambedkar to deal with the issue of minority in a parliamentary democracy and political representation he brought out a memorandum. 
or you may call it a small booklet, what is called communal deadlock and way to solve it. All of you must read. Uh, everybody must have read, uh, read annihilation of caste, but I, I do not know how many of you read communal deadlock and way to solve it and also state and minority. Communal deadlock and way to solve it and state and minority of the are the most important book of Dr. Ambedkar in terms of remedies and solution. They are the wisdom of Dr. Ambedkar for his entire life on certain uh, uh, for a solution uh, to this problem. But as far as the issue of political representation to the minority uh, in a parliamentary democracy in India which is characterized by, by the majority population of Hindu and minority population of Muslim, Charulka, Sikhs and others he find out a solution. Nobody else. And communal dialogue and way to solve it, he, he defined in, uh, the democracy, the political majority and uh, communal majority and he gave a solution. And this happened before constitutional assembly. He, this book is, this booklet is 1947. Now he includes his demand, his suggestion of the method of political representation to the minorities or re entire reform in the parliamentary democracy uh, in terms of uh, electoral politics, he brought it in the state and minority. So state and minority is the lifetime wisdom of Dr. Ambedkar on all solution that he has for the country as a whole as well as for the, uh, the, the deprived section. He brought in, in state and minority. Now what is the, what is the solution that he has given? Uh, the, uh, the book that has been referred to now, uh, where I have my article and uh, others have their article. My article is Ambedkar strategy for the safeguard to the minorities in parliamentary democratic system in India. And what is uh, Dr. Ambedkar's proposal uh, in a situation like this? His proposals are uh, very interesting and you must understand and all prediction that he has uh, mentioned there have come true today. Uh, also the prediction that he made in his last lecture 26th of November 1949, those all predictions have come today with respect to the uh, risk to the nation, with respect to risk to the democracy, political democracy. Now what are the argument of Dr. Ambedkar in the communal deadlock and way to solve it? Now the first proposition that he make is the following. That uh, the political majority and political party which get a political majority in, in British context according to him is based on ideology and policy, secular ideology and politics, policies, not religious ideology, secular ideologies, economic ideology, social ideology, political ideology and policies and it is on the basis of that secular ideology and policies, different party contains the election, the party which is liked by majority of the people constitute the government, form the government. But this political majority, remember well, I underline, political majority is based on secular ideology and policies, which the people like. If the people find that in the election, uh, in the uh, after they come to power, what they promised they did not do it, that political party is then thrown away in the next election. So political majority is a impermanent majority. It is a temporary, it can depend on policies and schemes and programs and it can come to power, it can be removed out of power. So political majority which, uh, which lead it to the formation of the government by that political party is a, is a temporary one. It may remain for 20 years like Congress has remained for several, several years but nevertheless Congress went out, other party came in, then there was a change. So you can see that the political majority uh, is is a temporary one, dependent dependent on uh, uh, ideology and policies and their performance. As against this, Dr. Ambed gave, gave another concept of majority, and that is he described it as a communal majority. As against the political majority, the communal majority, according to him, is not based as much on the secular ideology and policies. Although there is an ideology, although there are policies, but it is primarily based on the identity of a population. And that is a religious identity and caste identity and gender identity and ethnic identity. 
religious, caste and ethnic identity form the base for a party and to get a majority seats and to form the government. So, he visualized the danger of religion becoming a base of the political party and since a particular religion is in majority, it will continue to be in majority. So, he the feature that he gave of communal majority is that communal majority tend to be permanent as against the political majority which is temporary. So, the, poly, uh, the communal majority based on religion and caste tend to be permanent for uh, several years because the base is the caste and the religion which remain permanent and it cannot be changed. So, this is the difference that he brought in. Theoretically, he defined political majority and communal majority. Now, then by after defining the concept, he come to the second proposition that in India, Hindu being in majority and that there is likely to be a communal base, the religious base to the political party, uh, the Hindus are likely to became, remain, uh, get, uh, form a party, majority party and continue to constitute the power or caste, a certain caste which are in majority. And, if the, and the well, political base being uh, being the caste, the, the political party based on the caste we, will have a tendency to become a permanent. That is what we see. If there is a power of Reddies and Patels and Marathas in Maharashtra for the last 70 years, it is because they have a caste power within the, within the ideology also. There may be breaking fraction among them, but ultimately in terms of caste, particular majority caste will be in power. So, that is, uh, that is what Dr. Ambedkar visualized in terms of uh, religion and caste. And third proposition that he gave that if the communal, communal majority based on religion or caste or ethnicity or other consideration, if, if it is became communal and if it is in majority, there is a risk and danger to the minorities. Minority may not have a enough safeguard. Maybe uh, their, their, their rights will be withdrawn and many things can happen. He predicted at that point of time. Please read that book. Based on these three theoretical proposition, he then suggested a program that we should reform the parliamentary form of government in its application to the Indian situation. Do not borrow as it is the British parliamentary system. Because the situation in which the British parliamentary system operates is different than the situation that it operates, will operate in Indian society, situation. Given the diversity of population, you need to modify the working of the parliamentary democracy in a manner such that minorities get safeguard and protection. And he gave a proposal. There are three reforms he suggested in the parliamentary democracy in Indian context. One, he says that the, the number of the seat in the parliament and assembly of Hindu religious majority should be reduced. If they constitute 70 percent or 75 percent and if they get 75 percent seat, the seat should be reduced say to 65 percent. Hindu will remain a majority, but their seats should not be that overwhelmingly high that minority cannot do anything. That uh, Hindus or high caste remain permanently in power. So he. He, he gave a concept of balanced representation or relative majority, concept of relative majority and balanced majority. So, he, if you look at the chart in that communal deadlock and way to solve it, he has, he has reduced the number of the seat for Hindus, number one. And secondly, he increased the number of the seat for minorities. He increased the number of the seat for Sikhs, for Muslims, for Christians and for Shalu Kash and Shalu tribe. So, he said that the seat should be such that there is a relative balance. There is no disproportionate share of the uh, one particular caste which is in majority or one, one, one particular religion, but there should be balance in number of the seat. That this model is used many in many countries. New Zealand has used, they have given a substantial representation to Morbi uh, uh, tribe. So, this is the first suggestion that Ambedkar gave is the relative balance in the assemblies and parliament by reducing marginally the share of the majority and increasing the share of the minority, number one. Number two that, that he gives is decision making. Despite the fact that you reduce the seats of the 
the, the majority which is based on religion and caste, uh, the party will be still in, uh, in majority and will form the government. And minority will be still depend on the majority for any decision making that is made in the parliament. So, he suggested the second reform, very important and that reform is <laughs> that the decision in the parliament and the assembly should not be made, at least important decision should be made based on the principle of unanimity and not on the basis of majority vote or majority decision. Now, the decisions are made 49 versus 51, he, he said this is not correct. A political party which is based on a communal majority like caste and religion, uh, they will certainly always have 55 or 54 or 60 percent of the seat in the parliament. They can, if you follow a majority rule, all the decision can be done by them without any due regard to the opinion of the minority. Therefore, he suggested that on all important matter, the decision in the parliament and the assembly should be taken by unanimous vote. If all agree or more than 75 percent agree, then you take that decision, not by majority. And he gave an example of the social Sec uh, security council in UN. In UN, you know in security council that even one member's uh, oppose decision can't be taken. India's membership proposal has been denied several times by China. So he he argued that on 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 all important issue and particularly the issues related to the minority should be taken with a unanimous decision unanimity, so that there is a protection for minorities. Whatever decision is taken, a minority will have a say at least their opinion will be, they will be able to influence the opinion. This was the second reform that he suggests to improve the working of the parliamentary democracy or reduce the influence of the communal uh, majority government. And third is very interesting that uh, he has not described it, but after I understood it, I, 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 I name it as a principle of confidence or faith in the government. What is that principle? That principle is that the majority party will constitute the government, form the government, prime minister will be from that majority party, minister will be from that majority party, minister of minority will be from that majority party. But he suggested that who will be the, the person, uh, who, uh, who will be the prime minister of the majority party will be decided by voting by all the member in the parliament, majority and opposition. The prime minister will be from, from the majority party, no, no problem with that because they have a majority. But between them, between uh, majority party who will be the prime minister, this should be through a vote in the parliament. So that the majority will generally vote to a person from the ma majority party, minority will generally vote in the parliament for a person if there are more than two person from the majority party to a person who is who is better in whom there is a confidence in uh, of minorities that is one reform he suggested secondly the minister my, uh, in charge of minorities in the in the in the in the majority government but the minister in charge of minority will be exclusively elected by all minority the majority party as well as minority party uh, in the parliament. So, you have you are sending a minority minister in we in whom both majority minority and my, uh, minority uh, minorities from the majority party and minority from the opposition party have a confidence. So, these are the three principle of relative balance, unanimous decision making and principle of confidence and faith. These were the three principles on, on the basis of which Dr. Ambedkar suggested reform in the working of the parliamentary democracy and submitted that memorandum to the constitutional assembly through the state, state and minority. But this was too radical for the Congress. Anything very radical and different from the British parliamentary democracy was not, was not accepted. 
you know that Dr. Ambedkar wanted state socialism to be a part of the law of the constitution and Rajinder Prasa, Jawaharlal Nehru who himself was a socialist and other they got scared. The Dr. Ambedkar want to let down, defo, uh, let down in the constitution not only political structure, that is parliamentary democracy, executive judiciary but and fundamental right, but also economic structure, which is not done in the parliamentary democratic system of British time. But Ambedkar says that we should learn from defects of British parliament democracy and improve upon it. So this was the proposal given by Dr. Ambedkar for the safeguard of the interest of minorities in the parliamentary democracy and failing which he warned that the fate of minorities will be at risk if the political majority is a communal majority, communal majority in the sense that the base of political majority which form the government is religion and caste. In that situation the fate of the future and the policies of the minority will be at a, at a risk. Therefore this proposal should be accepted, which was not accepted, but in the 26th November lecture he gave warning that if you want this political democracy to be successful, you should have economic democracy and you should have a social democracy. And when he talk of social democracy, he essentially talk of what I have said you in communal uh, deadlock and way to solve. That is to respect the individual right and citizenship right of the people do not deny those right on the basis of religion or on the basis of caste or on the basis of ethnicity or on the basis of uh, gender. So I think uh, many of the prediction of Dr. Ambedkar have come true, I am not going to go into that. But now let me come to the last point that is that the, the current issues I will take and reflect on the, the current issue in my view are three which are in the public domain. One is about political representation. One is about certainly demand by women to have a political reservation because uh, because of discrimination in politics, they are hugely underrepresented. I think 14 to 15 percent as against their 50 percent population. The demand has been there for last more than 10 years. Secondly, the second point is the underrepresentation of the minorities, particularly the Muslim. Uh, the uh, other minorities we do not know, we do not have the figure on about Buddhist, uh, about Sikhs of course they, uh, they have, but we do not know whether it is in the proportion to population, at least I do not know. But certainly the under representation of the Muslim uh, is not in proportion to their population. Third issue, third challenge of political representation in my view is that for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, you have a political representation in proportion to the population, but because of the method of electoral method, what we have is the nominal representative and not the real representative of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. So these are the three issues uh, which uh, are very, very important. Uh, and that of course demand that whether we should have a political reservation for women and political reservation of religious minorities in some form is an issue which need discussion because they face under representation. There are other group uh, as far as the caste is concerned there are several castes which also ask that we are not represented properly. Uh, so but at a state level then the in the election the various political party give informally some representation and share to difference of caste. You can see in election is going on in Karnataka or when it goes to Bihar, what do we read? When there is election we talk, uh, we read that the seat of location and other thing is uh, determined by the sub caste population. Uh, even for the scheduled caste and for the OBC, within the OBC there are different sub castes which have their population and uh, those are given representation. So there is an informal mechanism which we have developed to give representation to the different sub caste. Uh, uh, that we have that method of uh, policy has been used informally by the various political party, but for political purposes to win the seats uh, this has been used, but in the process it give representation to the different sub -cast. Now uh, the, uh, the, the, that is the one issue, the issue of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe as I say is not the issue of political representation, whether the issue whether the representative are real or nominal that is the issue. Now, the this is connected this is related to the this is related to the 
method of election. Now, when Christians, uh, when the Muslims were given uh, the political representation, the separate elected method was used, and the same method was asked uh, was given by the British Prime Minister to the scheduled caste, to which Gandhi ji opposed, and then there was a hunger. Uh, the, uh, the Gandhi ji went on a uh, uh, fast uh, to death, and then the the, the Solution was the reservation for scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, but not to separate electorate, but to join electorate. And it joined electorate according to doc Dr. Ambedkar, which result into nominal representation of the scheduled caste, particularly, and not the real representation. And therefore, he had given the alt alternative method also. How does the joint electorate result into a nominal representation of the scheduled caste? I hope yeah, uh, you, you, you are aware about it. That there are reserve constituencies for scheduled caste. There are reserve constituencies for scheduled tribe. Now, reserve constituency for scheduled tribe uh, through through joint electoral method. What does it mean? A candidate from scheduled caste will contest, and all scheduled caste and non-scheduled caste will vote. Now, since the majority population is of non-scheduled caste, it is they who decide which scheduled caste should be uh, sent to the parliament or to the assembly. And obviously, the person who is who is elected by the non-Dalit will generally respect the opinion and the policies of the non-Dalit uh, non through a political parties. Therefore, they keep quiet. They have to follow the policies and the program of their political party which has il elected that particular candidate. Therefore, despite 80 scheduled caste candidate in the parliament, uh, Narendra Kumar has done a study uh, in fact earlier uh, in terms of how many questions are raised by uh, scheduled caste uh, representative, how many Dalit women raise, what kind of question he has studied and he found that uh, on the contrary, <laughs> he discovered that the issue related to scheduled caste are raised by other and not by scheduled caste, much less by scheduled caste. So, the point is here, the, the culprit is the method of election, that is joint electorate. What is separate electorate? Which is, uh, which is asked by Dr. Ambedkar, separate electorate means in one constituency there are two seats. One scheduled caste, one non scheduled caste. Scheduled caste candidate is elected only by the scheduled caste vote. While higher caste candidate is elected by both high caste and scheduled caste. So, scheduled caste have double vote. One for their candidate, another for uh, the high caste candidate. So, their power increase. Even voting the high caste candidate, scheduled caste can dictate certain policies. So, the separate electorate, in so far as the scheduled caste candidate elected only by the scheduled caste, that candidate who goes into the parliament or assembly is responsible to the people, that is scheduled caste. And he will do something for, because he is independent. Even if he is from a political party, he is represented, by, elected by the people who are scheduled caste, basically, he has to protect their interest. So, the they can be more real, the candidate elected through the separate electorate can be more real than, than the joint electorate. That is the difference that you should understand. Now, there are other concepts also, you know, multiple constituency and primary election and all that. I do not go into the complication and uh, there are some aspects which I also do not understand. But, but ultimately, at the time of the uh, approval of the re political reservation for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, Dr. Ambedkar tried and via media because separate electorates was terribly condemned by the Congress party and everybody which result, according to him which resulted into creation of Pakistan which is not the case but it resulted into. So, nobody wanted separate electorate only joint electorate and Dr. Ambedkar knew the faults of joint electorate because he participated in the election uh, through the joint electorate method in 1937, in 1942 and later on. So, he gave a via media what is called qualified joint electorate. And what is qualified joint electorate? Qualified joint electorate is this that the present electorate, a scheduled caste candidate will contest, high caste and uh, the, the Dalit and non Dalit will vote, that will remain. Only modification he suggested was that let us do the following that when a candidate is uh, 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 four or five scheduled caste candidates are there, and scheduled caste will vote, high, non scheduled caste will vote. He said, Let there be two ballot, ballot boxes. 
and you count the scheduled caste vote for a candidate separately and non scheduled caste vote separately so if there there are four candidate just see how many scheduled caste and non scheduled caste vote they got separately and then he say all those scheduled caste who have got at least minimum of 25 to 30% vote of scheduled caste should be considered for the final counter so if there are five candidate and only three of them got 30% vote of the scheduled caste only three will be taken for a final counting and in the three then you add the non scheduled caste vote whosoever get the combined vote which are highest will be the selected candidate now this is a sort of a via media between the separate elected and joint elected because a scheduled caste candidate which goes to the parliament and assembly think that i have to have at least 30% of the vote of scheduled caste i must work for the scheduled caste that will motivate him to work for the scheduled caste although he is from some political party even that was rejected this issue was raised by sardar sadappa a member of um, uh, constituent assembly from andhra pradesh he was from congress but he was forced by patel and other to withdraw the suggestion he would do it and in 1952 election this fellow didn't get the seat he was punished by withdrawing his seat now these are the this this is the solution uh, that dr ambedkar suggested i summarize that the issues are two three four under representation of the scheduled uh, women under representation of the religious minority and the lack of real representation of the scheduled caste in the parliament there are other issues of course i think these issues are Uh, still very uh, relevant uh, uh, today, and uh, uh, I think uh, they uh, they uh, need to be considered. Thank you very much.